Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. On the heels of Valkyrie's launch of VAVAX, the Valkyrie Avalanche Trust, we are excited to have John Nahas with us today for today's Spotlight Series webinar on Avalanche. John is Avalab's VP of Business Development. With us from the, from the Valkyrie team, we also have Josh Olzewicz, who is our Head of Research, and myself, James O'Brien. Um, I am Valkyrie's Chief Protocol Officer. So without further ado, let's jump in. Josh, John, how's it going? Hey, James, hey, Josh, good to be here today. It's always good to be here on days when people think crypto people aren't here, you know? Like, <laughs> like we, are, we are always here. A rise, fall, uh, you know, when the hay is, when the sun is shining, the hay is being made or whenever else, everybody's always here, so. The work never ends, right? Especially right. Uh, these markets, if anything, we're 24-7 we're for the most part. And keep building. Yeah, if, uh, if it's even possible now, we're, we're 25, eight. Yeah. So to, to dive into Avalanche, John, can you, uh, can you tell us just to start off at a super high level, where did the idea for Avalanche come from? Um, can you tell us a little bit about the, the origin story? Yeah, so um, Avalanche <clears throat> spun out of Cornell University where our founder, Emin Ginsur, is a notable computer science and distributed systems professor. Uh, Emin's been around this space longer than Bitcoin even. He was the first creator of a peer-to-peer eCash system called Karma in 2002. Um, he's been a lecturer, advisor, consultant, uh, and thought leader in the crypto space and distributed system space for a long time. Uh, Avalanche came to fruition uh, because of work he did with uh, two of his PhD students at Cornell, Kevin Seknicki, uh, our COO, and Ted Yin, our chief protocol architect. Um, and really the breakthrough was the Avalanche consensus. Uh, which was created. Um, so the history of consensus, of course, there's classical consensus that's been around since the 70s. Um, it's fast, it's cheap, but it's pretty centralized. Um, and then, of course, Nakamoto consensus came across in 2008 with the advent of Bitcoin, decentralized and trustless, but can't really scale too much. Uh, pretty expensive, a little slow. Avalanche consensus is the third ever uh, novel consensus protocol, um, decentralized, fast, um, and secure. So we, we, we aim to solve the blockchain trilemma. Um, on the heels of that um, white paper, uh, introducing the Avalanche consensus, the Avalanche platform was built on top of that. So the, the name Avalanche comes from <clears throat> the way the consensus actually works. Um, so it's you know, a gossip network. It does random sub subsampling one after another. And then after a certain amount of subsamples of nodes on the network, it all tilts and kind of falls over. So like an avalanche, it, it, it grows on itself and achieves finality rather quickly, uh, sub-second, um, and is quiescent and uses only as much uh, energy and uh, is pretty efficient. So um, that's kind of where it all came from. On that, the primary network was built um, and we launched mainnet in September of 2020. And here we are today. So did you guys... Did it like come about from them because of like scaling, because of governance? Like, was there something specific though that was like the impetus for this? Or did they kind of think like, okay, we have, we have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, we can build on that by, you know, using that as sort of a foundation for this idea. So I think, you know, the Emmons focus primarily is distributed systems, right? Like that was always his goal. Um, and kind of coming up with this new consensus layer really opened up the opportunities for, well, this is amazing. What can we build on this, right? Like, what can we use this for to achieve kind of the ends that this industry has always been looking for? So I think we've always, you know, we've seen forks of Bitcoin and, and, and other EVMs and other things of that nature. But, you know, the single monolithic chain model doesn't really fit every use case, right? We're always trying to put a square peg through a round hole. Um, Avalanche really as a network as a whole was built from the ground up to solve for these things. So if you take a step back and look at the primary network, you really see that it's a multi-chain network, right? Because the consensus can run a number of VMs. It can run a number of chains. So at the primary level, you have the X chain, you know, that's UTXO based, just like Bitcoin, um, but it's super fast. And that, that uses a DAG uh, rather than a linear chain. And that's ideal for payments, ideal for, for uh, logistics and things that need to, to finalize even faster, super high throughput. Uh, that's where the token lies, right? Uh, a box. That's where it's originally created. So anyone can mint and burn assets in the X chain. 
So they thought first and foremost, we need something to send and receive in a fast and cheap manner, UTXO based, familiar to the Bitcoin community. Then you have our P chain, which is the platform chain. So they took the administrative work of the chain and separated it. Um, that's where delegation and validation occurs. Um, and as rec and recently, I'm sure we're gonna talk about it, the ability for to, to launch subnets. So anyone who's a validator and validates the main network can also deploy a permissioned or permissionless chain to their choosing and configure that to fit kind of the business case or the application case that they're looking to do. Uh, and then finally, we needed a smart contracts layer. So that is the C chain. That's what people are most familiar with. That's the EVM compatible uh, smart contracts platform. All the tokens there, of course, are ERC-20. And at the time, my understanding was that, you know, they were looking at what smart contracts platform and the EVM for all of its faults, but all its benefits is the default smart contracts platform um, in Web3. So the EVM was chosen as that EM uh, and we've seen uh, adoption there. So for a lot of people who are familiar with Avalanche, they know that we have this, this kind of uh, dynamic network that can, that can scale, that can have multiple use cases for those less educated or less informed, of course, they think it's just another EVM chain, uh, whereas that's only one of three. Uh, and then the ability to build subnets, you can launch a Rust VM, a Wasm VM. So we're really gonna, we're just starting to scratch the surface uh, on what this platform, this network can really achieve kind of in terms of breadth of applications, of use cases, of um, building things. So I guess that's a long way of saying the impetus was to build something that allows builders and users the most amount of flexibility to build kind of without limits and to do what, what, what they really need to do. Yeah, I saw this blockchain as a service. I can't remember if that was you guys who had that on, on your website or something, but I thought that was a perfect like encapsulation of uh, the potential, I guess, for Avalanche, because you can't just like put it in a box and say it's only EVM or it's only AVM or it's only you know UTXO. Uh, I think it's good to have like that broad capability, right? Yeah, absolutely. And John, in the early days, was there any specific like real world use case that the founders set out to solve? I mean, obviously throughput solving the blockchain trilemma, but was there kind of something in the real world that they were really gearing this towards? Yeah, so at a very high level, our mission and the mission of, of Ava Labs and kind of the impetus behind Avalanche is to digitize the world's assets, right? Like that is a, the high level overarching goal and mission here. And with that in mind, that's why things were architected the way they are, right? I mean, we have trillions of dollars uh, and well, less than that after the past few weeks, but uh, <laughs> on global balance sheets, right? Whether it be physical, physical goods, whether it's... Um, you know, commercial paper, whether it's any kind of asset, real estate, you name it, um, that's either still in an analog fashion or maybe in an electronic fashion. You know, you have stock settling in T plus two, three and effects settling in, you know, in later times and things just not catching up to the digital age that we live in. So the ultimate goal is to pretty much digitize the world's assets. I mean, we see three pillars of focus, right? First being users, uh, and that's through wallets, right? Everybody is a wallet. Everybody should have a wallet, right? That's global adoption and users. Um, and then of course, assets and all assets should be digitized. That's the second one. And then the third one are the applications that allow users to interact with each other and transfer or interact with their assets. So at the highest level, it's the ability to, to digitize those assets. And that's where you see kind of those core subnets too that, that can be permissioned to build in regulatory safeguards and a million other use cases um, to really just allow the trillions of dollars uh, around the world to be digitized, to, fro to flow more freely um, and to unlock capital at a higher level. And, and John, we're gonna go way deeper into Avalanche specifically, but before we go there, uh, can you just share with everybody a little bit about your background and kind of you how you made your way into crypto? Yeah, sure. Um, so most, like everyone else who's over 25, because I'm definitely over 25, um, I came by way of crypto from something else, right? Um, we have a lot of young guys on the team now. It's, 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 it's fascinating to me to see that their entire professional career has only been in this space, right? Um, I actually was a policy guy um, for a while. I came out of school. I did corporate finance, corporate finance advisory for a little bit, went back, uh, have a master's in diplomacy. Uh, and I did the international policy tour for a while, spent time 
uh, in Geneva, Dubai, Moscow, Beirut, um, did stints at the Carnegie Endowment, worked with the World Economic Forum, did some, some stuff in DC. Uh, it was all about policy. And then uh, kind of fell into international trade, trade finance for a few years. I was doing OTC commodities, um, pretty much the most opaque business in the world, the, the, the longest business uh, standing, you know, international trade, moving goods around the world, uh, ports and all that like. Uh, and then I got bit by the blockchain bug like most of us. Um, mine, I think was around 2016, uh, you know, started investing, buying Bitcoin, it, uh, reading everything I could. And then the ICO boom, of course, came across. I was just joking with Josh. I remember his 33 by July tweets uh, from way back when, from the last cycle. Um, of course, was at a an event and like most people who get into this space was talking about crypto and blockchain and uh, got introduced to a friend, uh, through a friend to somebody who, who had just uh, started a new firm called Token Vault and uh, joined, was the first person to join that firm. So I dumped the kind of opaque old world international trade for this new technology uh, late 2017, like December 2017, uh, January 2018, uh, and joined Token Vault, was head of corp and biz dev. Uh, and we built a digital asset application for trading, spending, investing. So think an app that was like a Coinbase meets Venmo meets PayPal uh, meets Robinhood, where you can buy any digital assets, spend it, uh, do peer to peer payments um, with a focus of, though on security tokens. So I was heavily involved in that space. We did a security token offering in January, 2018 at the height of the ICO boom when people thought we were crazy, but we were the ones registering with the SEC and doing things the right way. Um, and then we built the money market token for Franklin Templeton and got acquired by Franklin at the end of 2019, stayed till the end of 2020, uh, took off, took some time off and then wanted to go totally crypto native. Uh, and joined the team here at Alpha Labs in uh, September of 2020, 11 days before mainnet launch. So it's been quite a year and a half. Yeah, and here we are. Uh, so quite quite the journey, really. Um, so for, for AVAX specifically, there, the consensus mechanism, you know, when you break all these down and you say, okay, this one's proof of work, this one's proof of stake, this one's a DAG, right? Um, for Avalanche, uh, the functionality of it is is different than other even proof of stake networks. Can you just run us through how it functions and how it's different than say like you know Ethereum 2.0, right? So, you know, at the at the fundamental layer, ETH2 and a lot of these guys still rely on a variation of classical consensus or Nakamoto consensus. Like there's no there's no real change. There's tweaks to make it faster, a little bit, or cheaper, a little bit, but not at a significant significant layer. So you see a lot in proof of stake chains are pretty much, you know, a little bit of a variation of classical consensus. Once they hit a certain validator count above a certain amount, they start to slow down. Things aren't as secure, uh, or they make tweaks or they or trade offs, right? So, you know, they might artificially keep fees down, but then that affects the security that affects the liveliness of the network. Um, the avalanche consensus level, a, a layer at that level, really just allows for scale to grow across all the chains because of, it's just spread out differently, right? Um, you know, every validator participates or has a participation in, in, in validating the chain. If you look at subnets, as well, if you are validating a subnet, the requisite is to validate the main chain as well. So there is an interconnectivity that works where there's not specific load focused on one place that could tilt. Uh, it's spread out. The gossip nature of it allows for things to, to do that. Um, you know, ETH2, we'll, we'll wait and see when, when once it comes out, how it's actually going to function in principle. Uh, I think in theory, it's, it sounds great. And we know we're excited to, to see that transition uh, for Ethereum's future. But I think a lot of things in this space are theoretical until they're proven. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's not easy creating these distributed systems. No, people like to take for granted the amount of, of, of work, the amount of research that goes into the work that this team is, our team has done, but also all the other teams, you know, credit goes to the innovation that's happening in the space. 
Um, but until it's really tried and tested, we don't know what, what works and what doesn't. Um, thankfully, Avalanche has been a year and a half and, and things seem to be humming along. So I think, um, you know, I, I urge anyone to take a look at the documentation uh, and, and see kind of how things break down on a more granular, granular level. Yeah, and I actually like in February 2021, uh, there was an app that was released, Pangolin, and you guys had were having issues. This will get into like the C chain, X chain, P chain question, but you guys are having issues. And you know, personally, I like to see some some struggle, <laughs> right? Yeah, because it's literally battle tested, right? Um, so, can you just like how did the consensus stuff? How was that affected by uh, like heavy user load at that time, and and what was the what was the hump to get over in that case? So you know, to your point, that was a few months after mainnet launch. Uh, yeah. Pangolin was the first DAP to go live. You know, we spent all this time building this great car, brand new car, piece by piece. And then you turn it on, you start driving, and then you gun it, and you know something starts to click a little bit. So you pull over. You take a minute, you check, you find what's wrong, and you fix it. Um, there was just tremendous load, and it wasn't optimized for that. Um, so some tweaks were made, and some corrections were made, and thankfully, you know, knock on wood, uh, we had one hiccup. And since that, there's been nothing uh, that's been humming along. Um, so the C chain, right, is, is EV. So with with high spikes of usage, there will be high spikes of um, of fees associated with that. Um, but as if you follow the charts, you'll see number of users, number of transactions continually rising. And you'll see some spikes along the way on huge NFT drops on, uh, you know. Um, Game five stuff, it. right? Yeah, but the, the, you know, despite everything going up and to the right, for the most part, we're seeing transaction fees go down. And the reason for that is we take a more conservative approach. We, we, we prefer uh, safety and liveliness over everything else, right? This is the health and security of the network is the utmost priority. Um, you know, the, the Silicon Valley notion of move fast and break things sounds cool, but when you're, you know, the distributed system that's securing billions of dollars, you cannot take chances with people's funds, right? You cannot take chances with the security of a network and for it to go down for an hour or five or seven or a day or two. Like you, you know, you can have an issue, you can have an issue once, maybe twice, but at some point, if you really want to be the infrastructure layer for the future, for, for, for global finance, for trade, for whatever it may be, you need to be reliable. Um, so we have always been on the more conservative side in terms of what can be done to improve the network, but not at the expense of its uptime and its safety and its security. So as you've seen uh, network upgrades come out, they have optimized for cheaper fees as it goes, because we start off with the most conservative and we tweak. Um, so Snowman++ came out. Um, that, was, that was a big upgrade. We've had several other apricot upgrades on the network level that have consistently brought the fee structure down and the fee levels down despite continuous transaction counts uh, growing on a daily basis. Uh, most recently, of course, now with the launch of subnets, you saw DFK and Crobata. Crobata was an idle game akin to Axie Infinity. Um, go off the C chain and onto a subnet. And it, in doing so, completely dropped uh, the fees on the C chain because Blockspace opened up and they have their own chain now to run their own application. And that's really the way we see this scaling. And we see Avalanche scaling where it thinks some others are going to have problems, right? The C chain, the main network is for innovation. It's for builders. It's for anybody to deploy an application, let the market test it, let it gain adoption. And once it hits kind of critical mass and is large enough and has enough transactions and is sustainable on its own, it can, it can port over to its own subnet, run its own chain, and take load off the C chain and allow that to continually be a virtuous cycle, hopefully, hopefully for more applications and more innovation. Because if we get to a level or any chain gets to a level where it's so congested and so expensive, then we're not really solving for any long-term problems. Yeah, that was gonna be my question about subnets too. Is, is the plan to start those applications on the C chain then? That's what it sounds like. And then migrate to the subnet or is there ever gonna be a plan to say like, 
you know, this app's going to be, we know this app's going to be popular or whatever, right? Maybe it's the DAP's decision uh, to start on a subnet versus migrating from CChain to subnet. So it's, I, it's both. And there's actually a third thing. So one, if it's EVM based, right, um, then it makes, if it's an app, it makes sense to start on the C chain, at least if it's something new, something innovative, something that needs to be tested, something that fits in the DeFi ecosystem or an NFT. Some things need to be on the main chain. Um, some things need to exist in an ecosystem alongside everything else and have that interoperability. But for other things, in particular games, um, they don't really need to live on the main chain, right? If you're a game developer, your focus is to build games. You're not a distributed systems guy. You don't, you're not a blockchain engineer. You build games, right? We saw this with Axie, right? They went, they created their own chain and it was successful, but they've had some issues along the way because their focus first and foremost is their game, their user experience, you know, building out users, not focusing on a distributed system. So we have about 50 to 60 games coming online over the next year that are going to go straight into a subnet. Because if you're a developer, you want to build your game. And if you're a user, you might not care about going on the C chain and doing all these things. You just want to pick up your phone right? Pop into a subnet and play. And this becomes your joystick, right? So um, that's kind of how we see the entry into Web3 for gaming is let people come and play the game. And the game can live on its own. It can, you know, the chain can be optimized and, and, and set up really to fit the parameters that the application needs, right? They're not changing their system to fit the chain. The chain can be configured to fit their use case. It can have their own gas token. It could have you know, infinitely low fees and limited validators. You can have many validators, but a little higher fees. The trade-offs are there for them to make uh, and it's incumbent on them to do what's best for their application. On top of gaming though, you also see a significant interest in rise of enterprise and financial services launching on supplements. Those need to go in because if you are trading a security, you might want to um, gate the access to that um, subnet with a KYC AML and accreditation. If we're doing a payments subnet, you might want everybody who interacts with that subnet to be KYC. So on the permission side of subnets too, you could gate um, access to people who have passed KYC AML or who are accredited, or you, know, you can keep people out of it from different jurisdictions that might be sanctioned. Um, you can build whatever compliance and regulatory safeguards that you would like for it, you know, I was recently on a webinar uh, as well from, from a payment with a payments executive. And, you know, we like to say uh, subnets are app specific chains. Um, I'll give him credit. He, you know, he called them business specific chains. So if you're an enterprise and you want to launch, a, uh, you know, your own chain, what exists in the market currently is either the public chains, but you don't want your transactions sitting alongside NFT projects and DeFi and a million other things. Um, regardless of whether it's abstracted away in wallets, you still don't want this people publicly seeing that movement. Or you have the enterprise chains. And the enterprise chains have tried to solve for this problem, but I think they've fallen short because they, they live in a vacuum, right? There's no USDC on there. There's no ecosystem. There's no other applications that they could pull into. If you launch a regulated permission subnet, you can bridge USDC from the main, from, from, from the C chain, right? You can bring in those assets. You can launch NFTs on the main chain and tie them in. You could do different things as this platform matures um, that enterprises up until now haven't been able to do. So we're seeing tremendous growth there. Uh, you know, our partners at Deloitte recently launched an application for the US government called uh, Pay As You Go or Close As You Go for uh, data retention and automated payments for FEMA, but they're scoping out subnets as well because they, I think they see the value in really delivering to on the enterprise level um, specific chains that fit the needs of those that are deploying it. Yeah, back to the blockchain as a service mm -hmm. idea. I mean, that that makes more sense to me versus like this DLT, uh, you know, Onyx GPM or, uh, you know, the million other ones that we've seen pop up. Where again, it's like their focus isn't blockchain engineering, their focus is something else, right? And they're maybe not the best, uh, you know, the best developers or whatever trying to get this thing on board. Um, so it definitely makes more sense to use something like Avalanche, right? In that case, specifically. I mean, that's, that's the value proposition that we're, that we're discussing. And to be frank, look, when you talk to the incumbents, right? Like JP Morgan has Onyx, and that's fantastic. That might solve for them. But I don't, I don't know. I Call me crazy. I don't see Citibank 
saying, oh, I'm going to go use JP Morgan's product. They're going to launch their own. And then Deutsche Bank will launch their own. And every bank will launch their own version of this. And then they'll remain in that silo. And they're not going to be interconnected and they're not going to want to deal with each other, right? One competitor is not going to you want to use another competitor's uh, technological product. So I think we need to take a step back. They need to take a step back. And so do we as, a, as an industry and look at this as really the infrastructure layer, right? Like I like to, to always say, you know, people don't know and really don't care how their money moves. They don't know if it's SWIFT or ACH or SIPA or Fedwire. They just know that it works. And all that infrastructure is in the background, you know, whether it's AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon, it's in the background. Um, we're building that platform to allow companies, to allow developers to build the applications on top that will fuel the next stage of growth. Gotcha, gotcha. So I have a separate, like a personal question about <laughs> the structure of Avalanche, the business. Because mm -hmm. um, I know you guys have Avalanche Foundation, you have Ava Labs, you guys are doing like incentive programs or have done incentive programs in the past. So I was wondering if you could just walk us through what that structure looks like as far as the delineation between the foundation and Ava Labs and just the, the incentive programs. Yeah. So, real quick, high level, um, you know, Avalanche was created that lives in a nonprofit. Uh, that has its own foundation. Me and my colleagues are employed at Ava Labs. Ava Labs is a separate for-profit entity um, based out of New York. We are the licensed service provider to the foundation. So we provide a service to the foundation to support the growth of the ecosystem. Um, and then separately, we have a mandate to build products um, such as the Avalanche Bridge um, that, that's done over 50 billion in transactions, but as well as a forthcoming core wallet and to work with enterprise and other product companies to build projects and protocols to launch on Avalanche. So we are a for-profit entity working to support Avalanche. Avalanche uh, Foundation is a nonprofit separate entity organization. The Avalanche Foundation has launched a number of uh, incentive programs, which we help promote. Um, and we have three of them. So we have the Rush program um, that is tailored to DeFi. That's really what kicked off a lot of the uh, the traffic and adoption of uh, last August of last year. So Rush is focused on incentives for DeFi. And what we saw there is it helped bring users to try Avalanche, right? So first it was bring the Ethereum native blue chips, your Aave, Curve, Sushi, et cetera, over. Because people want to use names they know and trust, right? So once that happened, that worked. Um, second, you have Ethereum native teams that started to build products natively on Avalanche too, like Alpha Labs that had Alpha Homora on Ethereum launched Alpha X first on Avalanche. Because of the speed of the throughput and the EVM compatibility, a lot of these projects that have been swirling in people's minds that they couldn't deploy on Ethereum, they started to find a home on Avalanche. And then finally, to round it all out, you saw a lot of native innovation happen on Avalanche, like Platypus, like Yeti, all these DeFi protocols that have always kind of needed or waited for a technology like Avalanche to launch we'd give incentives to users. Um, so what does that mean? A lot of people in crypto do grants to developers and to teams to entice them to build and stuff. Um, we're key, we, we, we do that, but not at the same level as others. We look at it differently. Um, we look at it as come build on us. You know, If your project works, we wanna make sure it works first. Um, if the market receives it positively, you need to have some users or else you know, it could be the best thing, but if no one uses it, it doesn't matter. But if you build something good and the market responds well to it, we will incentivize users through liquidity money to come and use it. And it's a, it's a, it's a positive feedback loop, right? You bring in more users, they use it, they use other things and the thing continues to grow. So we focus on incentivizing the user rather than that, rather than the builder, because if the, if the project succeeds, the builder succeeds and we succeed, right? But a lot of these projects do this thing where they, 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 they support everything under the sun just to bring it over. And then you, never, you don't know if it's going to work, if it's a good team. So we want to focus on supporting them with bringing the users to actually use their product. Um, so that was Rush. And that was 180 million focused on DeFi. Earlier this year, we launched the Multiverse campaign. That was $290 million. Uh, and that's to support the growth of subnets. Um, so we launched that ahead of the DFK and Krobata launches. 
um, we've got about anywhere from 60 to 100 something that's coming online the next by the end of the year early next year uh, yeah, i saw that list the other day on twitter and i was like wow because i'm not personally plugged into avalanche a lot but uh there's a lot that coming. was very cool yeah yeah, I mean, whether gaming, uh, we've got payments, we've got some really cool, innovative DeFi stuff that needs its own kind of, you know, uh, area. We've got enterprise and a million other use cases. And, and the point of, of multiverse is to support those teams too. So same thing. It could be in the, in the form of rewards. So if you're a game, you build the game, game works, people start using it. We'll, you know, throw some incentives in there to get more people to use it and really bootstrap that growth. Um, to a tipping point where it becomes sustainable. Secondly, to run a, a subnet, you need to have a validator. We prefer a minimum of five. So with that is 2000 of ox to be a validator. So we might lend them or you know, delegate a vox to help them set up that, uh, that initial infrastructure so that they don't have that kind of overhead um, to get off the ground. So we'll help them set that up um, and then marketing, whatever it may be. So the second, the second incentive, uh, program multiverses for subnets and to grow that out. And then at the summit in Barcelona, we announced the culture catalyst. So uh, the primary focus there is to support our, uh, creators and artists, um, not just your typical NFTs, your profile pictures, but really pushing the bounds of where NFTs should go um, through arts, culture, music, right? So music videos, clips, um, gated experiences, right? If you're an artist and you're going to drop a single and you own that artist's NFT, you might get a preview of the album. You might get the single before it goes out. And the first and major partner there is uh, Open, which is OP3N. It's a new application that's launching. Um, think of it as Spotify, but gated with, with NFTs and its unique experiences and AMAs uh, with artists um, across the board. So uh, Grimes is going to be launching a, a, a metaverse children's book on there. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, recording artists and uh, entertainers who are going to be doing projects uh, launched on there over the course of the next year. We really see that as a way to bootstrap uh, you know, the creators and, and the artists to create new and cool stuff that, that, that push the bounds on, on, on kind of the arts and culture web three stuff there. So those are the three programs that we use to really incentivize builders, artists, creators across the board to come and build on Avalanche. Gotcha. And the can you run us through the, the Yuga Labs board ape uh, proposal? I, I don't know if the, that, that was part of the culture catalyst. Um, no, that maybe... was, to be honest, that was um, some really eager people on the team who were like, hey, this this would be fantastic if it came, if it came on Avalanche. And uh, I you know, on the BD team. So we have a, a pretty significant size BD team now that, that, that I helped lead. And it was just a, a group of people across the firm who came together and like, we want to put in this proposal. And it wasn't like a, even a concerted effort. It was just the thing kind of snowballed. Um, you know, that's that's one of the main reasons why I love Ava Labs and, and the culture here is, you know, there's a real entrepreneurial spirit. And a, a, a lot of people, regardless of how long they've been in this space or how new, there's, there's that go-getter mentality and people just wanted to do it. And we're like, cool, um, go ahead. Um, so they put the proposal together and, you know, we thought we'd be a great home for that, but they want to stay at Ethereum. So that's fine. Cool. Yeah. I mean, but it's great that there's not only is there like competition, but there's actually like options to, to migrate, right? Like voice exit loyalty or whatever. And if, if projects want to get poached or get find about a better infrastructural home, you know, those options are available, right? Whether yeah. it be AVAX or wherever else. Yeah. John, a, a question on the left field that's teeny bit. So, so talking about, you know, y'all's impetus of creating Avalanche specifically to digitize real world assets and then all of the NFT conversation that we just have, uh, that we just had, excuse me. And then also kind of the intersection of subnets that can be designed for specific financial application. Um, is there anything going on in Avalanche right now for the NFT application and digitization of like mortgages or other like indelible proof of ownership kind of real world assets? So there's a handful of uh, great projects that are building uh, similar use cases right now that we've been talking to, right? So um, whether it's mortgages, invoices, uh, I think is, is a big thing, right? So if you go back to invoice factoring, that's a really big uh enterprise around the world, you know, people's ability to sell their invoices, to, you know, to, to, uh, to get payment up front on terms. 
Um, so whether it's mortgages, um, invoices, um, lots of other things, right? So something we're starting to toy with, you know, record, different kind of records, um, you know, on-chain data, on-chain um, identity. So shifting from NFTs to like something like an NTT, non-transferable token. So you own something that verifies that you are X or you are Y or whatever um, can really unlock use cases. So across the board, we're seeing a ton of innovation. A lot of these things do take time um, to be done and done right. But whether it's on subnets or on the C chain, uh, we're seeing a big growth in, in re real world use cases that change things. You know, I often like to say, what we've been seeing a lot of in DeFi and across the board is just kind of taking traditional finance and making it decentralized or, or, or making it faster and cheaper. But I think, you know, the, the killer app that uh, Web3 is going to have hasn't even launched yet. I don't know. I don't know what it is specifically. I don't know what's going to work. But I think there's some amazing talent coming this way um, into this space. And, and a lot of cool things are being built. I mean, I, I see everything under the sun across all the verticals that, that we, that we cover. And there's some really interesting builders out there that are, that are really pushing the envelope. So um, I think we've just seen the first inning of what NFTs really can be. I mean, it's, you know, the digital arts is fantastic. It's great, but I think whether it's loyalty, whether it's engagement, whether it's, um, a million other use cases, I think we're just barely scratching the surface. It's only been about a year or so, right? So um, if you think about it, you know, an NFT at the end of the day is a certificate of authenticity. You know, we buy a, a pesky little, we buy something, we get a pesky little card in it that says, you know, certificate of authenticity and that goes in trash. But essentially an NFT is, is a token that's a certificate of authenticity that proves that you own this thing that is sitting on IPFS, or that might be sitting on my desk if it's a real world item that I could scan a QR code for. So if you start to think, and the way, what excites me is we live in a, you know, the web two world and the current world uh, relies heavily on your personal data, right? So if I'm going to buy a pair of shoes from a company online, that company has my name, my address, my phone number, my credit card, knows everything about me. And in an age of privacy and personal information, who knows who gets a hold of that, how that can be taken advantage of. Well, if we start to abstract that away and instead you have a wallet, right? And that wallet, you buy something. I buy a pair of shoes from wherever, and then I'm going to sell it to you, James, in a secondary transaction because it's a collectible. You know, that pair of shoes or that handbag or whatever has an NF associated NFT. I sell you that item, I share that NFT, I give you that NFT. Well, now they don't need, they, the company loses track of me as the initial purchaser, but currently they also lose track of you. But if I share that NFT with you, now they can go straight to you by doing an airdrop or something else, but they don't need to know that you're James O'Brien and this is your birth date and this is your credit card number. So we can possibly use NFTs in my opinion. And from what I'm starting to see as a way to really allow people to retain their information again and their privacy and to kind of take back a little bit of, of what's been shared abundantly over the past couple of years. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I'll never forget the day that I ordered a pair of uh, a pair of sneakers actually from one of the sneaker marketplaces and literally came with a QR code on a little tag token, you know, through one of the lace holes. And I was like, 85% of the work is already done. Not the technological work, obviously, but the physical real world work is already done, delivered to me. All I would have to do is scan this thing and they've got their NFT where they can track consumer adoption and you know the, the transmission, I guess, of that specific pair of sneakers from now until forevermore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it makes sense, right? There's certain things that should be shared and there's certain things that don't. And I think there's great builders out there that are building amazing um, platforms and use cases and the market will find, kind of pick what wins or, or doesn't but the technology now exists to allow for these things to happen and i think uh, you know in, in an age of decentralization uh, increased privacy is always going to be helpful so yeah i fully agree and then so we've, we've talked about a ton of different use cases right and obviously the uh, the avalanche network and subnets are being used for any number of things 
if you had to kind of break it down by percentages and not that you need to give us actual percentages, what would you say is the most consistent and widely adopted use case? And then maybe the next two categories like DeFi, NFTs, GameFi. So I would say on the main chain for the C chain right now, uh, I would say DeFi is, is, is the big winner for sure. Uh, we've definitely made a huge push there. Um, uh, and then with subnets, it's definitely gaming. Gaming and GameFi is, is huge, uh, whether it's Castle Crush through Wildlife Studios or Probata or DFK. And we have AAA games with like two, $300 million budgets like Shrapnel coming online, and Ascender. So uh, as of now, by far, uh, GameFi is the runaway winner uh, in terms of who's building the fun on subnets. But enterprises and uh, traditional finance applications are really um, picking up significantly. So I would see kind of a, a leveling out there um, happen relatively soon. But as we know this, you know, enterprises have a, a much different definition of short term than we do in, in our industry. Uh, you know, we're 24 7, 365. Uh, you know, sh short term for us is a couple of days and long term is a couple of weeks for them. Short term is a couple of months. Um, so they definitely move at a slower pace, um, but I think the ideas are there. I think the applications are there. It's just going to take a little bit more time, uh, particularly on things that have uh, compliance or regulatory um, connections. You know, you got to make sure all the T's are, are crossed and the I's are dotted uh, before those things go live. But I think over the next year, you'll see a lot of innovation. Yeah, and that's actually a great um, a great segue to another question we wanted to ask you too, which was so recently y'all launched an institutional team. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like that's particularly applicable, not just for what you just said, but also for today's audience. Can you share a little bit more with us about that, the plans yeah. for that business unit and their strategic objectives? Absolutely. Um, so maybe I'll take a quick step back and kind of give you guys an overview of how we see kind of well, the verticals that we focus on. So across the business team, there's... Um, I'll start on the most crypto native side of the spectrum. There's DeFi, then there's NFTs, then there's gaming, then there's exchanges and wallets, and then enterprise, and then finally institutional and capital markets. So uh, Morgan Krupetsky recently joined us. Uh, she was chief of staff to the chief compliance officer at Citibank. Before that, she was uh, in FX for I think about 10 years or so. Comes from Wall Street, knows, uh, knows compliance, knows how things work and should work. Um, so she's going to be leading our institutional capital markets team uh, with a focus on really working with institutional players, with, with TradFi, and really you know, working through that vertical with the goal of first and foremost uh, of education, right? I think whether it's me, Josh, you, James, any of us in this industry, our first mandate, unless we're an engineer, uh, which I'm not, um, anyone who's not an engineer, their first focus should always be education. Uh, if we really want to onboard billions of people and hundreds of millions of people, we need to educate them and we need to bring down the barrier of entry, make it easier, um, but also educate on the things that matter and differentiate the quality from the kind of hype stuff, right? Uh, we always seem to get lumped in as an industry with the meme coins and, and the, the dog coins and all the things that really don't have really long-term utility and, and, and enterprise value and can shape things, right? So we need to first educate on the differences there. Secondly, we need to integrate, uh, educate on, on the technological aspects, on why things might be better this way and work this way. And then finally, educate on how that a specific business function can be made more efficient or more transparent or more decentralized by using this technology. So there's a gap there, uh, whether it's, you know, institutional investors, family offices, pensions, hedge funds, high net worth individuals and, and the like, they need someone to help them, right? To, to bring them along on this journey and to be an ally and, and an educator. And that's the first focus there. Second focus um, is to work with great firms like you guys, right? Um, to really create different kinds of, of assets uh, that, can be, um, that can be utilized, that can be invested in. Not everybody's gonna go on Coinbase and buy a token or hold a hardware wallet. Um, some funds, RIAs, whoever it might be, need structured products, need things through firms specifically like yourselves for OVOPS or for any other token. Um, and then of course it creates some new products, right? Um, 
know, baskets or indexes that cover different different things uh, that can be tokenized, that can be digitized, that could be you know launched on Avalanche for investors around the world, uh, and you know so security tokens, right? So those are kind of the three things: education, um, expansion, and new products. And I guess back to the the subnet conversation. Like, is there is there a subnet trap where you know uh, Nate uh, in the comments was asking uh, who's gonna which chain is gonna have the most transactions? You think like in one year or five years, right? Is it mostly gonna be C chain or is this you know we saw this this like peak and trough on the C chain as far as transactions are concerned as there's this migration to subnets, right? So if we have both migration to subnets and initial onboarding to subnets directly, where where do the transactional throughputs, you know, where do you see that uh, like standing at the end of the day? I think, you know, I think you're going to see a cycle. You're going to see things peak on the C chain and then move into a subnet, which, you know, and then which adds the total network activity. So then it'll just continue to, to spiral and maybe avalanche into a larger and larger vault. Um, though you see C chain <laughs> transactions go down, overall network transactions are up, right? So yeah. you can't look at it as a vacuum. You have to look at it as total network uh, transactions, right? So if you take C chain plus DFK plus Kravata right now, it's on the whole, C chain might have been peaked and gone down, but on the whole, because we've migrated those transactions off, right. it's still higher, right? It's still trending at the same levels. Um, so it's definitely going up. Um, so I think it's going to shift, right? You might have a new application on the C chain, it might be huge and C chain will spike in transactions. And then potentially it'll move off and then overall transactions go up. So um, I, I, I see use cases across the board, right? I think you, you, you can have uh, specific use cases and payment use cases on the X chain that could spike uh, there, which would be great. So, yeah. yeah, I saw the the misconception, you know, even myself, I didn't know why on the Explorer data I was seeing transactional activity dropped you know, like, like 70%, right? Like I didn't know that it got migrated to a subnet <laughs> that wasn't apparent in the data that, I, that was presented. You should have probably launched that dashboard before things moved to a subnet. Um, There's definitely a lot of uh, confusion for about a week. Yeah. Uh, a lot of FUD, a lot of what happened here uh, kind of a thing. But, you know, we took two massive projects and moved them off the subnet. So um, yeah, that dashboard came a couple of days after that well it's kind of hard to launch a dashboard to show something that doesn't exist yet either right so um the dashboard came out after and then everyone's like oh okay well, it makes sense yeah but it's not just your dashboard either it's you know it's nansen it's oh, yeah. snow trace right it's it's all of these who um i'm sure they understand avax and understand well the, it takes the them time to do, right like we can't yeah. be like hey guys we're gonna do this on this day make sure it's ready at this moment like it needs to be out there and then once it is they'll integrate it and if those guys have a million other things going on aside from supporting us only. So of course, uh, right. give them a little bit of time, but. Yeah. And I guess that leads me to like, think like, is there a Dune analytics coming for, for AVAX? Do you, do you guys have any idea like project wise, if any of that stuff's in the pipeline? We are, uh, we have been for a while and are continuing to build up all the key infrastructure and data and reporting tools and everything to support uh, subnet expansion. Um, for a long time to come. Yeah, because as a data guy, for me, you know, I'm looking, I'm literally trying anywhere I can to find data on these subnets, and I just can't. I just, it's not, doesn't exist right now. So, um, th at least that I was able to. They're new, so yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, they have their own explorers. They're gonna have all that stuff. So, so, um, you know, putting it all together is gonna be exciting. Yeah, for sure. And as far as uh, future developments, you know, what are you excited about? Uh, I know we've hit on a million different things, but what are like your top three excitements uh, for the, the remainder of this year? I think, oh, well, of course, top of mind would be to see all these subnets that we have in the pipeline that are being developed right now go live, see them in production, see them gain usage, see just the overall network, how it's going to handle this. I think what we're doing here is going to really show uh, how networks can scale and, and drive adoption across multiple uh, verticals. So, you know, 50, 60, 70, that's by the end of the year, potentially that's that's gonna be tremendous. Um, and hopefully a thousand or two or more by next year, who knows? Um, but I think that's first top of mind, just to see that is gonna be exciting. 
Uh, I think it's gonna be transformational for the space. I think for a lot of people who don't know Avalanche or are unaware of Avalanche or aren't familiar or just know the sea chain only, I think seeing it actually happen, not hearing me talk about it or, or seeing you know these, these, these hopeful comments, but actually seeing this all come to fruition is gonna be a big change uh, in, in the industry in general, uh, in terms of scalability, in terms of expansion. Um, so that's one. Um, Two, uh, you know, I'd love to see what's going to come out of this current kind of bear market, whatever you want to call. The best things always come out of these situations. Uh, Avalanche was born out of the last bear market. Um, so this is the time where, you know, innovation really thrives and the people that are building great things really have their heads down and work hard. Um, so that's two. And the third thing, and I always say this, the thing I look forward to the most is, is something that I can't even think about yet or conceptualize, right? It's going to be that new thing that comes out it's not a replica or a better, faster, cheaper alternative to something that currently exists, but something completely different. Um, the potential killer app for Web3, the thing that none of us thought of or have thought of, but some genius somewhere is building, and um, whether it's on Avalanche or wherever, uh, excited to see the innovation that continues to come out of this space. Yeah, and I guess the last thing that I have is it, we talk about, you know, we talk about the breadth of, of crypto and like multi-chain future versus bridging versus single chain uh, does do you have like a personal view or stance as far as where you think we're going to go with that and how avax yeah i know they have you know you guys have bridging capabilities it was super popular we saw a bunch of activity uh rise in those verticals in the past few months um you know because we're talking about subnets to me those are kind of you know housed on on Avalanche, I think you guys are talking about subnet to subnet transactions as well. Those are in the yes. works. Yep. So, you know, how, do, how does all of that sort of fit together in the future? So first and foremost, the future is multi-chain. Unequivocally, without question, the future is multi-chain. The idea that any chain, any single chain can handle everything for the rest is kind of crazy, right? Like AT&T cannot handle every phone call in the world. Like, come on. Um, so there will be use cases that, that need specific chains and niche chains. Do we believe at Avalanche that subnets are that solution? Yes. But there will be others. There will be other innovations that come across. There will be other innovations and other chains that, that, that launch that could also be a virtual machine launched on an Avalanche subnet. But ultimately, I think the system as a whole, a single infrastructure can't handle all these use cases, right? Like, a single bank can't handle all financial transactions. A single telecom cannot. It, it just, it's, uns you know, God forbid there's an, an issue or an attack or something on any one participant, right? Um, so without question, the future is multi-chain. Um, and I think Avalanche is complementary to that and supports that because anything that launches somewhere else could launch a virtual machine on Avalanche, there could be a bridge there. We built a bridge uh, to Ethereum, $50 billion has been transacted on that bridge. It's probably one of the most, if not the most successful bridges out there. It's fast, it's quick, it's efficient. We're extending support to Bitcoin. Uh, so we're going to be bridging uh, Bitcoin over to Avalanche uh, really soon. So that's going to be non-custodial. So for those that are used to wrap Bitcoin, that's custodial, that's held in custody somewhere else and wrap. You're going to be able to move your Bitcoin through our core wallet over to Avalanche. It'll be btc.b. The .b is for .bitcoin. Uh, the, the wrapped assets we have for Ethereum are .e for Ethereum. So we're bringing Bitcoin over. So, you know, that the asset and the technology that kind of started this all has a place uh, on Avalanche and DeFi and, and to be utilized uh, in a non-custodial manner. So really excited for that. We're going to continue to expand our bridge to other chains. Um, there's great bridge technology out there that's really trying to facilitate that, that multi-chain future. And, and we're fully supportive of that. So. Look, at the end of the day, I think we all we all win together or we all kind of beat up on each other. We're still so early that there's maxis that exist. Um, to me, maxis are a sign of how early we still are because people have been in this space and think that it's a winner take all when in reality, if we all if we all if if we all at some level work together and continue to work together and grow and innovate, there's plenty plenty to go around for all of us to be successful. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, um, you know, as a user, I want a wallet that can 
that where I want to do something, I don't care like if it's Avalanche or if it's Ethereum or if it's whoever else. Like, you know, if I'm want to, if I want to gamify, I'm gamifying, right? Like I don't care that Ethereum's expensive today, right? <laughs> like that's that's how it should work 100 percent Yeah, I mean UX and UI and usability are king and everything else, right? All it's all about accessibility. So why would it be any different depending on the chain you want to interact with? Yeah. Users will go where it's easier, faster, um, and affordable. So that's pretty much all I, all I had. I don't know if James has anything. No, I, I have think a, that I have a random. I have a random question about lore. I know you guys. Uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> the DeFi stuff is like it's like penguin, pangolin, and like some other animals, right? Like, is there a reason? Like, no. <laughs> get together. There's, a bunch of, there's a bunch of animal protocols. Um, Platypus. Platypus yeah. is actually a really cool, uh, innovative avalanche native application. It's a single-sided AMM for stables, low slippage. Um, but yeah, there's uh, pangolin. Is yield, is yield yak too right yak yeah mm -hmm. there's yield yak there's um penguin um finance there's yeti i don't know if yeti's an animal is yeti an animal I think yeah sure, sure. Yeah. yeah it's something yeah. if we yeah if we're talking about lore yeti's definitely an animal i mean there's a ton there's a ton no i don't know how that to be honest how that happened. i think it just kind of happened on some um, i mean they make great mascots they do and then there's trader joe of course um <laughs> Uh, and Banky, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have some amazing teams building some really cool stuff on it. So uh, I think we're starting to see a, a new wave of, of DeFi innovation coming. I think a lot, I think a lot happened over the course of the past year, year and a half. But I think during this market is when you really see the innovative stuff start to come back. Um, so I'm excited to see what comes up in the next six to nine months on the DeFi side. Awesome. Well, that, uh, that about brings us to the top of the hour. John, thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Um, and for everybody listening, thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, as, as you all know, if you ever have any questions popped up on the stream right there, please feel free to reach out on socials, um, shoot us an email, invest at ValkyrieInvest.com. We'd love to hear from anybody and any and all questions. Thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Thanks, James. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, John.